session plan, a little bit of a short history on sociocracy and some of its key principles, Unicorn Growth, the recurrent structure, and implementing and experiencing sociocracy. Then we'll go to our panelists and we'll do Q&A. Um, Irina's looking after the questions as we go. So if you want to ask a question, please feel free. You should be able to see um, a little symbol saying chat. And if you type your questions into the chat, then we'll see them. We'll be able to answer them as we go. Okay. So, um, subtly lower expectations as we start. I'm definitely not an expert in sociocracy and definitely not an expert in the history of sociocracy. But I borrowed this quite nice um, image from Sociocracy for All in the US. And it's a few of the key people who've helped form sociocracy along the way. So as you can see, it's not a new idea. Uh, we can trace it right back to 1851. So the bit I thought I'd focus on is the more recent history of sociocracy. So you can see here, um, not too sure about the pronunciation here, I think it's Case Booker, uh, 1926, implementing consent decision-making in a school setting. So we have um, a really interesting history of a practical application of a theory of sociocracy. And what happened was a uh, Dutch civil engineer, pacifist, Quaker, decided to see how this would work in real life and applied it in an education setting to try and bring children, teachers, parents all together to create a self-governing community, drawing very heavily on Quaker principles. Um, and that experiment was something experienced by Gerard Endenberg. He was at that school as a child. He then took all of that learning and that knowledge and later in life applied it in an organizational setting. So he um, was working in a, a company established by his parents called um, Endenberg Electronics and he developed what we know today as the circle method, the sort of sociocratic circle method, the way of organizing. So there's um, a lot of information out there actually about this which is really fascinating, well worth reading but you, you can definitely find um, a lot of that online just by Googling. You can also find it in the book, We the People by John Buck and Sharon Vilnez, which came out in 2004. And I think the really interesting thing here is that sociocracy was pretty much unknown, unheard of outside of the Netherlands, I think Germany, um, places in Europe. And then it really spread after this, this book came out. It was sort of uh, John Buck is known as the person who brought it to the US and then it sort of spread more, more recently. Um, there's also some people in this, in this nice screen who are part of Sociocracy for All now in the US. And that's an organization we've been working with from Unicorn. And they have done a lot to bring sociocracy into the limelight in recent years. So, as I said, whistle stop history with no real detail there, but there's a, a lot of information out there. So, moving on. So, Gerard Endenberg, um, he created a living laboratory for sociocratic governance in this company, and the double linked circle structure, which we'll talk about more in a moment really came to life then and is still very much the underpinning theory for sociocracy. So when I first heard of sociocracy, the sort of key concepts that came across that got me very excited about it, I think the first thing is that it's about no one being ignored. It's a way to hear all voices within an organization. And that's, that's such a key part of cooperation and being part of a co-op that it just, it struck a really strong chord with us. And then we also heard that sociocracy was going to bring effectiveness. So you understand that the work that you do together matters and you start to think about how you can make that as efficient and effective as possible so that you can see really tangible results for all the effort that you're putting in collectively to make your co-op or whatever other form of organizational business work. Um, so collective time is always really precious, whether you're in a co-op or elsewhere. And making the best use of that is something that I think we've all been striving to do for a lot of years. So systems and ideas to help improve that's always really, really welcome. Transparency is a huge part of uh, what I've always known being part of Unicorn and um, other organizations with very similar ethos. But I know it's not that common across the business world in general, but having like an open access to information, really, really crucial. 
uh, for this. And feedback, which I think is something we all try and do all the time um, when you work in a more horizontal organization that really values hearing from each other. But learning how to give feedback usefully, learning how to build that into the way that you develop um, in terms of connections between people, but also in terms of organizational development is really, really interesting. And then sociocracy, this idea of continuous learning, trying something out, learning from it, trying it again, not looking for perfect before you can move on and make a decision. That's uh, another really crucial piece. I haven't actually typed it and I'm, I'm wondering why I haven't, but the, the key phrase from sociocracy is good enough for now and safe enough to try. And I think that's a really, really useful mantra for the sort of getting the mindset of all of this. A little um, definition is that uh, for sociocracy, um, those who associate together decide together. So as with democracy, autocracy, the first part, the socios, are the people associating together. Um, I could say so much more about that, but I realized time would, would run away. Um, so this is another slide that I've borrowed from Sociocracy for All in the US. They don't mind, it's public access. And this is the way that they describe sociocracy these three key elements. So organizational structure, double linked circles, and we touched on that really briefly with Gerard Endenberg's work, so that's where that comes from. This idea of continuous evolution by feedback, that you're always looking to learn, you're trying to take in new information at all times with whatever you're doing, and then from that, developing new ideas, being brave enough to try them out, see what happens and keep doing that. And that's, that's quite revolutionary, I think, for some of us in the co-op world where we're, we're much more used to um, thinking and talking about things for a while before we'll, uh, we'll decide it's a risk we're willing to take. And then decision-making by consent. That's um, another key part of this, consent decision-making. And I think Pete's definitely going to talk more about that later in some more detail. But I'm going to take each of these three um, so in sociocracy, we're talking about these circles and circle working. So what you need to know about that is that in an organization that's running sociocratically, everybody's a member of at least one circle and circles are small working groups. There's about four to seven people is the ideal number. And then within these circles, every circle has four roles. They might have lots more roles, lots of operational roles within the circle, but four key process roles and that's um, a coordinator role, um, a facilitator role, secretary and delegate. So your coordinator, or sometimes referred to as the leader role, is the person who takes the overview of the work of the circle and what's happening. Facilitator is facilitating your meetings. Secretary has responsibility for taking minutes, note sharing, keeping information. And then delegate, this is kind of a fairly new idea, um, is having somebody who's solely responsible for sort of representing what's happening in your circle. And that's important because as you, sorry, oops, I think slides have shifted around. As you double link through an organization, you have two people attending the next circle. You have your coordinator, your leader, and you also have your delegate, and they have two quite distinct roles to play to do that properly. Um, so I think, <laughs> Also, something that you have to know about sociocracy early on is that in circle working, you have this emphasis on equal participation, which is so crucial to how it all works. And that's usually um, speaking in rounds. So if you speak in rounds, everybody gets an equal chance to speak. So that means it's easier to listen, easier to pay attention to what you're talking about, what you're trying to decide between you because you're not sort of waiting for your turn, thinking, ah, me, me next, please. You know it's going to come back to you, and you can sort of relax into the meeting. And that's something that we've really enjoyed doing, uh, those of us who've been doing this for a little while at Unicorn. So um, there's lots of different types of rounds, and we always start with an opening round, which is something uh, we would have loved to do today, but um, it's great there's so many people here, which made that a little bit impractical. But an opening round just helps set the frame, how you're showing up in a meeting, and that means you can share um, like things for us. Perhaps we've just been on the shop floor doing some really difficult um, work, maybe helping a customer, maybe just come from splitting a delivery and trying to find all the relevant bits of paper or whatever it is. You can just share what's going on for you, kind of take a breath, take a pause, and then get ready to, to join the meeting. Um, we might talk a little bit more about this later. So then in your meetings, 
you are trying to make sure that you have this real emphasis of equality for participation. So using rounds is a core part of that, but also wanting to have process that supports that possibility for everybody to engage on an equal footing. So socioxy for all term this, understand, explore, decide, and this is a framework we found really, really useful. So first of all, you just want to understand, make sure that everybody understands what you're talking about. So in that, that would be your clarifying questions round. Make sure that everybody knows what you're discussing. Um, a chance to explore, and this is, I think, you know, crucial piece for how to run meetings efficiently and also be able to hear from everybody. So for us, that's um, doing a quick reaction round. So quick reaction round would be, what comes up for you about this topic? What's, what's your initial reaction to this? Anything you'd like to share? And then when you've done that, um, you can move into making a consent decision on something. And at that point, you're asking everybody whether they will go along with, um, with what's being proposed. I realize I'm rushing through something that's definitely a webinar topic all on its own. It's a, you know, it's a quite a big process and there's lots of different ways of um, looking at this and using this depending on what you're doing at any given time. But um, the key point here is that you take this stage by stage and you make sure everybody's ready to move on to the next step before you do. And then when you become familiar with this, everybody kind of always knows where they are in the process and it creates this, this nice working space where things aren't up in the air or difficult. Um, this is a key piece for consent decision making and I really would like Pete to talk about this um, maybe a second if he could jump in. But, <laughs> how to how to understand consent is that we're framing it with um what's your personal preference so we all have personal preferences on um whatever topic it is under discussion but also what you can work with what's within your range of tolerance and if we are looking at everybody's range of tolerance much bigger space in which you make a decision than if we're just looking at everybody's personal preference so this relates very much as well to being really clear about what you're trying to do and what the aim of, uh, of, of what you're trying to do is um pete could i call on you to maybe have a few minutes to talk about this would that be okay uh yeah just to give you a little break perhaps i mean you're doing a great job it's going really well um uh, yeah, I mean, specifically on that thing about range of tolerance and, and so forth and consent, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that most people have got some sense of what we're talking about now. I think you've been explaining it well, but it is a lot of information. Um, well, I th just to summarise, I suppose what we're talking about is um, when somebody uh, has made a proposal of some kind and then I'm in a round and I'm being asked whether or not I consent to that proposal, I th the, the question is, how do I make that decision? How do I decide whether to say I consent or I have no objections? Or, or how do I say, actually, I do have objections? And, and this, the picture that um, Abby just put up is a, is a way of thinking about that, which is to say that um, there is a, a range of tolerance. So there are things as an individual um, you can put up with, and there are things that you can't put up with. That's kind of how I think about it. So it would really, obviously, it really depends on the situation. Um, and the other thing about it is that uh, the best way, and again, I think Abby's made this point, is that you have, you know, you learn, you really learn sociocracy by doing it. I mean, when you do rounds and you go through consent, the consent process many times, you start to get a sense of when it's right to object and when it's not. That's probably the ultimate way to do it. But I suppose for me, what it really is, it's a kind of a bit of an inward looking question where I kind of ask myself, do I, you know, is it really going to hurt me or particularly is it going to hurt the co-op and, and what we're trying to do as a goal? Is it really going to stop things happening or am I just trying to stop it for some other reason? Um, I, my, my sense would be that most people, you know, I don't know how you are, but when um, somebody presents something towards me, I almost have an automatic habit of kind of saying no first. That's my first response. So, so for me, I have to kind of get over that a little bit and then think, you know, is there really something kind of serious here? Is I, I like to use the term critical. Is it, is it really critical that we, um, that we stop this? And, and then I think the other thing Abby's kind of alluding to is that when that thing comes out, if it is important, then we find a way to kind of deal with that objection and, and integrate it into the work. 
rather than use it to kind of block the progress and block things moving forward, we find a way to integrate it. Is, is that enough, Abby, to be going on with? That's perfect. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, I'll go back to the screen share if I can. So one way this was um, explained to me recently as well is just if you frame that question of whether you consent to something, it's sort of what's the risk we can't afford to take? And anything within the risk that you can afford to take, you have um, a way to try and move things forward. So... And, and that point you made about good enough for now, safe enough to try is exactly is right in that space, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah, that's the, that's always the mantra. Is this good enough for now? Can we make something work from this? Is it safe enough? And um, giving people the space to to work out whether whether or not it is, I think, is yeah, absolutely key to that. And, and can, I, can I just add while we're talking about it? I mean, the, the, the other kind of philosophical thing that surrounds all of this is the idea that actually it's better to be moving forward and trying things than it is to be spending time in arguments and, and blocking things. So, so there's a kind of trust thing that we assume that actually we try something, nobody can know actually how it's going to turn out and, and that's better. It's a kind of general assumption behind all of that. Yeah, definitely completely agree with that, Pete. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on with a little bit of explaining the structure side of it. Um, I talked about double linking earlier and this this um, slide you can hopefully all see kind of shows what this looks like. So if you imagine you've got two people in circle two who are also attending circle one, then you have this, this crossover of people and they're both full members of both circles. The idea is there's sort of a circular information flow. So you have your person one taking information out of a circle and person two sort of bringing the information from that circle back into the first circle the way we understand this at Unicorn is the coordinator of the circle would have the responsibility of bringing the broader focus back into the circle that's connected to, let me see if I can show you this to make this make a bit more sense. Um, so each circle would have a different range of focus. So you have the more specific focus on your sub circles or sub sub circles. And then as you move up through an organization, the focus gets broader. So if you have your coordinator very much taking this role of from the broader circle saying, right, okay, so coming back into the more specific circle, this is what we need to keep in mind. This is what we need to be framing our decisions by understanding what's going on in the business. Um, then you have your delegate representing the views of the circle and taking that into the broader focus. And in that way, you should have a really good flow of information. So this is a double linked circle structure, just to give you an idea of how the information would flow around uh, between all the different circles. These can be quite simple for some organizations and they can be really complex for much, much bigger organizations. I've been learning recently actually just how many different uh, companies and schools and co-housing groups and cooperatives and all sorts of people are using sociocracy around the world and some of it's yeah really simple maybe you've got sort of three or four linked circles and and some just sort of keeps dividing exponentially and uh, you have many many people connected this way so this is what we were just talking about in terms of consent decision making uh, as pete referred to this progress this moving forwards is taking things forward so um, so for referring to it as circular steering at the moment, so lead, do, measure. So you lead on something, you plan what you'd like to do, you agree that in your circle, you do it, you put it into action, and then you gather feedback, you measure what happened, and then you keep on doing that, and hopefully you're heading somewhere useful um, over time. So this was just another way of phrasing this, experiment and evolve, lead, do, measure, put something forward, address any objections, try and run with it on a trial basis. All good sociocratic uh, decisions come with a time frame. So you say you'd be doing something for, if it's not that safe to try and you're really not sure about it, it might be just for four, five, six weeks, it, or it could be something that you're going to review again in three years time. But you always want to put a time scale in there so you know when you're going to come back and measure how well it's worked, evaluate, change it if you need to, and repeat and keep going. Uh, until you feel like you're making some progress. So um, do we have any questions so far? 
You have, Abby. So we, we've got somebody say, asking, is there a minimum size in terms of members in which sociocracy works effectively, i.e. not having every member in every circle? There's definitely some much smaller organisations out there that are working sociocratically. So one circle, single circle organisations can still be sociocratic. Uh, so as long as there's more than, I guess, even just two or three of you, you could, you could run sociocratically. Okay, and I've got a question here. I don't know if I can frame it properly, but it sounds to me that sociocracy seems very more about doing it um, and kind of getting on with it. Moving forward, all of that seems to be um, quite characteristic of it. Um, whereas perhaps my corporate background was that you have to involve everybody first in the part where before you're doing it, and that can be the blocks. So is, is, as soon as you say we're doing this sociocracy, sociocritically how do you, whatever the word is um if you're doing it that way does that open up already everybody's thinking and that allows for you to start coming up with ideas that immediately aren't blocked as they would be traditionally i think um so yeah it's quite a big question i guess but um there's an idea in sociocracy that you can always start small you can you can take some key concepts you can assume that you're looking for consent for example when you suggest something new and you can work from that frame where you're assuming consent and you're assuming that you want to take people with you if you're trying to bring in something new um, there's a really good article actually about that which we can maybe share the link with afterwards sort of concepts you can use and you know take on board and use straight away without having everybody's big agreement to use um sociocracy um i don't know pete if there's anything you want to add or kirsty um not really i think that's a good answer lots of questions coming in i see yes yeah, so another one how many members would each circle usually have i guess numbers seems to be important um and there's one other as well oh, carry on if you want to answer um that. so the classic answer to that is four to seven members um the idea that seven is about the limit to have good, really good discussions in a, in a small group. But also the answer to that is it's totally flexible and whatever works for you works. So if you have um, a circle that maybe has 20 members and you're not coming together to make a lot of decisions, but you're coming together for info sharing and checking in with each other, that's absolutely fine. And circles can work like that. If you have a circle that needs to be making a lot of decisions together, keeping the numbers smaller is going to work to your advantage at unicorn we're looking for circles of around nine people because we're calculating in sort of the impacts of annual leave uh, absence maybe cover on the shop floor which would probably mean that most of the time there'd be six or seven people attending a meeting okay we have got more questions coming in but i think we'll try and theme them at the end a little bit more or as we go and also any of those questions that aren't answered we can do that later and send you uh, your answers directly okay thank you um so unicorn uh we at the moment have 68 members um we all hold director status so we are a very flat structured co-op we we're very proud of that we've been going for nearly 23 years now and we started as a small collective of half a dozen people. Now we're up to nearly 70. Um, everybody multitasks. So we all have a mixture of shop floor work and we do administrative back office tasks as well. So any member of the co-op can ask to mix up their tasks if they don't feel like they've got um, something administrative to do and it's just too shop floor heavy they can look to find another role and vice versa if you find that you're doing more administrative stuff and you really want to do more shop floor there's always opportunities to do that and I think sort of the crucial piece for us is that we've always wanted everybody to be a worker and that's so fundamental to who we are so we wouldn't want to ever have a system in which we had people doing management and then other people doing the work everybody is both uh, we have a flat wage structure so everybody earns the same and we value all work contributions equally so whether you're predominantly serving customers and stacking the shelves downstairs or whether you spend quite a bit of time for example in finance wrestling with all the figures you are going to be doing your work at unicorn because you believe in this let's value everybody equally framework um flat management structure so there isn't a management committee or a board of directors we are all the board um and for years well i think from day one we've used consensus decision making in our members meetings 
And that goes really well, actually. I would say for the most part, we've got a really nice system in our members' meetings. Everybody is on board with how we do consensus. It's quite a pragmatic form of consensus. It's a consensus minus two. So we have a blocking system where we'd need three members of the co-op to block something. And then if something is blocked, it's not a complete dead end. We then take it to a workshop. We bring people together. We work collaboratively and we bring something back to members. So for us, consensus and consent are fairly similar, um, fairly similar things. I've got a little video. We've worked out that unfortunately the sound doesn't work. So you might not be able to hear anything, but we do have subtitles on it. We just made this. Um, I say we, I can't really take any credit. My colleague Debbie just made this two weeks ago. So we're about to link with a co-op in Rojava in Syria. And we said we'd send a little introductory video to them. And we've mostly got the women in the co-op in this video because um, we're linking hopefully with a, a women's cooperative in Rojava. So I'm going to show you this. And sorry for the lack of uh, lack of sound. So we did want Abby to talk over this, but she's actually hearing the sound and we're not. So, <laughs> And Abby can't talk outside of what she's hearing because that will mess everything up. So, <laughs> But you can see some of the pictures and subtitles, I hope. I can, uh, I can try and talk over. <laughs> I can't quite hear myself, but anyway, um, yeah, this is some of our members. That's Nina stocking the, um, the juices. And you can see the deli counter behind and the tills. Um, and this was filmed, as I say, just a couple of weeks ago. So this is very much how the shop floor looks at the moment. And a few of my colleagues waving goodbye. <laughs> so. Um, this is our timeline. Um, I mean, Still, can you see this properly still? Yes, yeah. Great. Um, so 1996, the co-op was established and we ran everything in, I've put easy in inverted commas, but you know, easy decision making with up to um, 15 members. So everything was done in sort of the one circle, if you like. Uh, 2004, we'd reached a size where we felt we couldn't um, bring in more members until we looked at the structure. Again, I'm saying we, I wasn't, I wasn't there back then, but um, I've done a lot of reading about it and talking to uh, other co-op members about it. So I must feel like I was, <laughs> but, uh, but I wasn't. So we had set up with this framework that said that 15 was kind of the, the maximum number for this human sized, family sized group interaction. And that comes for those of you who are familiar with this Roger Sawtell's blueprint for 50 co-ops, which was a hugely important document for us when, when we got started. So in 2004, we wanted to be able to bring more members into the co-op. The business was growing. Uh, a group of um, my colleagues, many of whom are still here, um, decided on a system that would devolve decision making. So we introduced teams and sort of an umbrella team system as well with sub teams underneath it it's actually quite similar in some ways to sociocratic design which is interesting so we feel like we're sort of revisiting our roots um, and within this system there's a central forum where representatives from the different teams would come together once a fortnight check in with each other share information and it could make small decisions in forum uh, usually small spends just above the team spend threshold but below what we'd need to bring everyone together for, for the members meeting. And this worked really well and um, still does work today, but you know, worked really well until 2012, 2013. And we went into a period of rapid growth then. And we brought on a lot more co-op members. And this is actually when I joined as well. 
So we were noticing, people were really noticing that we were struggling with decision-making at Forum. We had more people there. We had more teams. Um, decision-making in the members' meetings because there were just so many of us sort of packed into the room and the old way of doing things wasn't quite working. Um, and some of our teams were just reaching this point of being bigger than the 15 magic number when we devolved back in 2004. So there was a real sort of sense of needing to do something. And in 2015, there was a decision taken to do like a big wholesale review of the structure. So three of us did that and we reached out to other co-ops and we did lots of sort of surveys in the membership and talking to people and thinking, what do we need to do? You know, what, what options do we have to, um, to make this work better for everybody? And at that point, what we decided was we weren't going to make any major changes. We were going to revamp our consensus process, which we did. Um, we were going to look at some of the ways that teams were working together. And we were basically going to, um, to take the phrase of uh, someone who was working with us at the time, work smarter to keep things running as, as we had been doing and retain that sort of collective ethos. So we didn't want to do anything that brought in any hierarchy and we didn't want to lose what made sort of unicorn feel so special but we knew we wanted to do something. So after 2015, we put together a sort of semi-permanent, longer-term structure team uh, group of people to start thinking, like, how can we do this work smarter piece? What can we do to make things um, stop creaking so much at the seams with, uh, with the number of members that we had? So we made lots of smaller changes and some worked, some didn't, uh, some are still going now. And then it was late in 2017, we sort of stumbled across this thing called sociocracy. And it felt like it was a real opportunity for us. Um, so this is that's kind of what I've been saying. This is a slide I took for a presentation we put together for members a couple of years ago. Um, it's just this sort of idea that if you're making a decision in a large group, it's definitely more complicated than in a small group. And if you've got everybody in the room at the same time, it doesn't guarantee that you've got equality of participation. And in fact, for a lot of people, being in a room with sort of 70 other people is a way that they're going to really struggle to articulate their ideas and their thoughts. So formal hierarchies are definitely not inevitable, but alternatives take a lot of perseverance and work and imagination. And I think that's something that we all sort of subscribe to at Unicorn. So what we've been doing for the last couple of years, right now it's 2019, I have to start saying for three years, which feels like quite a long time, mm -hmm. uh, is looking to redesign the collective management structure so that the membership that has been growing, it's a bit static at the moment, we've sort of made a decision not to recruit whilst we're just working all of this out, um, to, to make sure that we continue working well and we're still somewhere that people really want to be. And that means thinking about decision making, what do we all need to decide together and how can we make sure that we are sharing power without having everybody overwhelmed with all the decisions that need to be taken in a vibrant, busy business like Unicorn. So that's a lot of that for us is about the team meeting structures. I think we've cracked it for the members meetings, but our teams, some of them are pretty large, over 20 people making changes for that and for them. Um, and then we've realized that there's quite a lot of hidden functions. There's a lot of work that people do that's not sort of part of a particular team necessarily. So we wanted to sort of make all those things visible and understand um, all of the work that was, was happening. So this is um, a slightly naff diagram I put together of our current structure. So we've always described it as a wheel. So the members meetings are the outside and that's that sort of boundaries our structure for decision making. And that's all of us. Um, we've got 23 teams at the moment. Most of them come to forum, but not all of them. Some of them are littler teams and the sort of sub teams of other teams. And we have quite a few projects at any one time that uh, various different members will be involved in. So it kind of it pretty much functions like this. You've got your members meetings taking, you know, lots and lots of the decisions, forum making the smaller decisions, teams having quite a lot of autonomy to get on with things, but lots of stuff sort of filtering to forum, back to teams, forum again, then up to members meetings. So it can take a little while to get things decided. Um, so I thought I'd pause as well at this point and just see if any questions about Unicorn have come in. There's, um, there's quite a few questions. Um, how do you avoid hierarchy? I think you um, were talking about that in your presentation already. Um, also, somebody asking, what is the pay structure? What it actually is the pay? It's very nosy. <laughs> um, 
and um, can you give an example of circles at Unicorn uh, specifically? Are they organized by functions or something else? Okay, um, so hierarchy, well, we know that hierarchies will always exist in terms of experience, length of service, the amount of time that um, you've been there often brings more weight to your voice and to your ideas. I think that's just human nature and that's, uh, that's how things tend to go. But what we've always been really keen to do is to try and see where there might be any um, hidden hierarchies and to try and sort of understand why they exist and how they exist and how we can always make things as open and traversable as possible for members in our structure. So I think hierarchy is an interesting I often say we're kind of allergic to hierarchy at Unicorn because if anyone mentions hierarchy, we tend to say, no, we don't do that, we don't do that. But we also do understand that sometimes there are hierarchies of knowledge and experience. So obviously, um, people on our finance team, they're very, very much trusted to be able to work out financial projections and sort of guide spending decisions. And of course, we all trust that because that's a key part of what they're doing and that's part of collective management. Um, So I think it's just sort of how it's framed. Um, and there's yeah, another probably two hour webinar on its own looking at hierarchy pay. Uh, we've just had a little pay rise. We're up to 12 pounds an hour. So everybody earns that. And um, that's a pretty good wage for the sector that we're in, in grocery. And we're, you know, we're quite proud of that. So it's, um, it's a, it's a reasonably well-paid job in the sense of if you look at sort of other people working in retail, what they'd be earning. If you look at what finance managers might be earning in a a company with a sort of turnover that we have, I'm sure it's far below, but um, you do this kind of job because you believe very much in the ethics of it and the social change aspect of who we are as a co-op, which I think I've um, never left out of a presentation before, but I haven't really talked about that today with uh, with Unicorn. Um, Circles, we are going to come to in a minute and the different function areas. So... Shall I move on? And yeah. Uh, okay. So, what we've been doing then with Sociocracy is initially uh, last year, beginning of last year, we brought a proposal to Forum just for a small budget to for a few of us to learn the basics. So I'd um, sort of accidentally attended an advanced Sociocracy webinar, something that just came into my inbox. Um, and was one of those annoying people that said, oh yeah, but what is it <laughs> in the question and answers uh, and realized it was something really interesting and I wanted to find out more. So we connected with Sociocracy for All and they had at the time, I think they've changed it up a little bit now, what they called the Empowered Learning um, Circle Program, ELC, or as one of my colleagues dubbed it, and it's forever remained the Early Learning Center Program. Um, so we, six of us got together to do that and we asked for the hours and the co-op said, fine, we can do that. So we had um, these 90 minute video led sessions Uh, exploring the basic concepts and getting to practice talking in rounds and using consent decision making and so on. So we did that for the six sessions and we had um, some meetings online with Ted from Sociocracy for All who was coaching us and answering our questions and at that point all of us decided this this seems great this has a lot of really positive things that we think we can bring into the co-op. So then we went back to the membership um, to the full members meeting this time and asked for a quite a bit of a bigger budget to uh, continue with this work and we asked for the six of us to carry on with fortnightly meetings to explore sort of what implementation might look like and to roll out the training that we'd been um, receiving to the membership more broadly start a consultation process and start looking at um, what a new structure could look like with the aim of producing a proposal for this May so we're working on that at the moment Uh, Two of us participated in the Sociocracy leadership training with Sociocracy for all last year. Um, We've continued a relationship with SOFA, so we have sort of check-in meetings with uh, Jerry from Sociocracy for all fairly regularly. And we've been working with our largest trading team, there's 25 of them when we started this, in a trial circle structure. So I'm going to go through some of these sort of design principles of sociocratic structures just to explain how we've sort of come to where we are at Unicorn. Um, So you have a general circle, which is a little bit like our sort of central forum. 
which is tasked with sort of information flow, making sure that the department circles are all well connected and understand what each of them are doing. Um, so this question of sort of aims and domains and um, sort of functional areas, it's the, the question asked about the functions, it's really important that people understand um, what's happening in which bit of the structure. And I think that's something that we've been working on generally for Unicorn um, and tend to do a lot more of because I mentioned hidden functions. There's often stuff that happens that's really important that it's happening, but it's not sort of designated to a particular area. And this, it makes sure that everything is, is very open and everybody knows exactly where the limits of authority lie for any given circle. Um, then move to department circles. I borrowed some slides from uh, one of my colleagues who put together a presentation on this for our members recently. Hadn't realized I had to click for each little bit of text to come up. Um, so this is four or five, usually department circles or forums um, taking a specific business function. And then again, acting as an information point for the circles that are connected in, in the same department. And having decision-making authority for, uh, for the issues that sort of span the various teams or circles within the department. So like we have with Forum now, we tend to bring anything that sort of crosses teams, comes to Forum, so that we can make sure that everyone affected is, um, is happy with, what, with what's going on. So similar idea. Then, oops. So the actual sort of working circles or the team circles. So every department would have a varying number of these. It could just be um, a couple or it could be sort of five or six. And they need to have their very clear domain setting out the limits to their authority. And it shouldn't overlap with the net of crucial part sociocracy here. Um, and some circles will be sort of permanent or I think nothing's ever permanent. Everything should be dynamic in a sociocratic structure, but some circles will, um, will be more permanent and others will be much more temporary. So a temporary circle that comes together particular times of year for a specific function or a temporary circle that comes together as a helping circle to um, research something specific or come back with a recommendation, for example. Then we have the sub-circles. So this, again, can really vary. There might be none at all or there might be several. And it's specific aspects of the domain. So if you have a large domain, so the example we've got on here is um, personnel, the HR function. We have um, a membership committee now, which is a group of members um, elected each year to make the decisions on, on new members joining the co-op and they take feedback from across the, uh, the whole of the membership to be able to, to make that decision. Um, so that's like a very specific piece of the domain for the, for the personnel team um, that's looked after by another connected group. So very similar in sociocratic structures. Um, again, temporary helping circles or more permanent and then there can be lots of layers. So I mentioned at the beginning, there are some much bigger organizations that, that sort of do this and have circles sort of going for, for several levels. And then this is something that happens for more hierarchical versions of sociocracy, which you can certainly have. Um, a mission circle or a top circle, I think actually sometimes it's referred to as a council of elders, which we quite liked at Unicorn. Um, and that's the board of directors. And that in your sort of classic um, classic structure, you'd have your board and then maybe your sort of senior management team and um, departments and so on. So sociocracy does seem to work really well, whether you're a very flat structured organization like Unicorn or you're a much more hierarchical traditional organization. There's a way to bring it in that, that works for both. Um, so, oops. A unicorn, this is the members meeting. So we definitely are not looking to introduce any kind of board of directors other than the one we have now, which is all of us. So this, I was trying to summarize, you know, where, where we're at, at the moment and what do we think that sociocracy offers unicorn. So a framework for further devolution and distributed authority is the key part of it. So looking at this clarity over who's doing what, why they're doing it, what the aims of, of what they're doing are. 
um, being really specific about the functions, the different functional areas, and that's how we've been looking to set circles up. Time, if you've got smaller circles, so if you had a meeting, which we do have now of 20 plus people coming together for an hour a fortnight, that's sort of 20 plus working hours used in that meeting. And if there's a lot of actions that come out of it that people don't really have the time to take on, and then two weeks later, 20 of them are coming back together again, you're using quite a lot of our collective management time to not necessarily make that much progress. If you have six or seven people coming together for an hour, you then free up a lot of other hours for getting on with the work that needs to be done to support the functioning of the decision making. So I think that's been a, a key key idea for us if we're able to create a structure where we're all very actively involved in decision making in perhaps slightly smaller pieces of the sort of team system then we have a lot more time to make these decisions together and make them work well uh, using the consent process in team meetings which is sort of the area we've we've identified as needing the support to um, boost decision making and then some meeting tools that really reflect cooperative values. Um, so again, it would be a webinar on its own, but all the different sort of ideas that Socioxy brings in for how we can explore ideas and how we can work together to, to uh, make decisions. So this is our working draft of a new circle structure for Unicorn. Um, I've underlined draft because <laughs> it keeps changing. We're doing lots of consultation with members at the moment and we are working really hard to make sure that we're covering all the different functions in the business and that we're making logical distinctions for the circles. I'm sure a lot of this won't mean anything to many of you because it's, um, it's our weird acronyms and things for explaining what's what. But um, if I give you an example, so we're looking at this operations circle. So having a forum style department circle of people looking at operational decisions would mean that a lot of decisions that now come to the general forum where people are a bit like mm, I don't really know would be taken by people who are working within the operations sphere so we were looking at linking together um, some of our current teams into this thing called facilities management that seems to make a lot of sense um, bringing together IT maintenance security health and safety to avoid some of the duplication that happens now with sometimes with people um, doing bits of work in two different teams and then realizing afterwards that that's what's happened and also the people element the HR element the training and of course finance so people making smaller spending decisions can we afford it uh, you know what's the implications for the maintenance of the building and so on can happen in that area um, and it's I've got so used to it now because I've been working on it for a while. It looks less complicated to me, but I know each time we unveil it, people go, ooh. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably quite hard to explain quickly. Um, but what I can show you is this one. So the veg team last year, they had reached about 25 people. They were really, really keen to try and do things a bit differently. And they asked... Uh, for the support of the socioxy circle to have a go at redesigning the veg team functional area um, so we worked with them to put together this idea of various sub circles and like a central coordinating circle for the veg team and it started off with four and now it's three so we've got veg people looking at training and staffing needs and working with any probationers um, We've got the operations group, which is all about the shop floor display, communicating with customers, deliveries, uh, dealing with the waste streams and so on. And then we have veg buyers and veg buying such a um, really huge part of Unicorn, people who put so much time and energy and effort into making sure our fresh organic fruit and vegetables, which bring so many customers to us, are fantastic quality and well priced and everything so this is a huge piece of work that's um, happened ever since we started having people doing the dedicated veg buying role on rotation so having space for them to meet to work on a lot of the stuff that sort of surrounds the veg buying role and having other people taking specific areas of responsibility and connecting it together through a central circle sort of that was the plan um, we wanted to also give everyone in 
sorry, it's a lot of background information, I suppose, to make this make sense. But at the moment, if you work in a particular area of Unicorn, you're usually on the team. Nine times out of 10, you're on the team. So if you do hours um, working a veg, putting the veg out for customers, splitting deliveries, then you're on the veg team and you'd come to the meeting. What we wanted to do was say to people, all right, so you might be doing that function, but possibly your headspace is somewhere completely different and you're really involved with the deli team as well or you're really involved with education and marketing team or whatever it happens to be. So a few people decided to stay within the wider team, but not be on a circle. And that's been an interesting um, sort of learning experience for us and thinking about how the feedback works within the team and then the circles. Uh, so we've had various successes and challenges. I thought I'd start with the challenges. <laughs> um, so it was designed to accommodate all the existing team members who wanted to be in a circle rather than thinking about what's like the functional need, which meant we started off with too many sub circles and there was a bit of an overlap of um, who was responsible for what and a little bit of a lack of clarity. So we then reformed it and we've had the three sub circles, which have been working much better. Some members have said that they do miss the connection of the full team meeting. So even if the decision making wasn't working brilliantly, there was that lovely sense of we're all in the room together once a fortnight and connection is a huge part of sociocracy. So we're thinking about how we can um, work that back in somehow. A little bit, not many, but a couple of reported instances of sort of information flow um, being a little bit lost across the, the wider team. It's taken a while for people to sort of get familiar with some of these processes, uh, probably longer than we initially thought it might. Uh, but now I think most people feel like they do know what they're doing and they're comfortable with it. And we knew from day one that there would be difficulties kind of linking one sociocratic bit of the business in with non-sociocratic bits of the business. So that's definitely um, that's definitely been an issue. And our rotor, super complicated, definitely a two-hour webinar. I don't think it's one that many people would want to come to. But um, the rotor makes it really tricky to just sort of arrange meetings spontaneously. So we have to work within the kind of current meeting slots, which makes it trickier to accommodate the sub-circle system. But we've also had a lot of successes. Um, the working circles being smaller means we've got sort of tangible results in making progress on goals that uh, the team have we've done um two lots of evaluation that we haven't finished evaluating where we're at now but sort of the midway point through uh, the trial there was really sort of high levels of satisfaction and engagement reported and most people are feeling that sort of generally their participation and participation of their colleagues has sort of stepped up a level through the system which was great and it's been just a really useful learning experience for those of us outside of it and those of us within it um, thinking about how we can devolve decision making to smaller groups and thinking about you know whether you do need to be part of all the decisions or whether you can see very clearly you no know, these people can take this piece and they can make good decisions on it my feedback is still very valuable into how that works so i'm just going to slip uh, skip back a couple of slides and just finish with um some reflections on challenges of implementation more generally um we have a real lack of meeting space at Unicorn. We have one large room, which you saw in the, the little video, and we fit everybody in there, but that's also the space for lunch times. We have an office space where we can have a meeting of about 15 people around the table, and we have some little offices that can fit smaller meetings in, but everybody's working in those spaces. So unless we can build upwards on the roof, we are going to struggle with having the room to do meetings. The rotor is super complicated and being able to just staff the business and having, um, we all multitask, it's a huge part of who we are, but it means that people are sort of here, there and everywhere through their working day. I think if you were in a tech co-op, for example, you'd find this much easier <laughs> to be able to just have meetings as you needed them. And sometimes we have overlapping domains because of the people involved in particular teams at the moment. So we're, you know, we're looking at how that would play out. Developing understanding of processes definitely takes time. We need to have that headspace to step back and think, right, I'm learning something new and I want to uh, give this a chance. And whether it works for everybody is still a question mark because we all have different learning and communication styles. And uh, Pete and Kirsty and I were just at a conference two weeks ago 
talking about sociopathy at work. I think it's the first one in the UK. And this was something we talked about quite a lot, how to make sure that if you're introducing these new kind of processes, everybody has a chance to come along with you and they're not um, left behind. And then just having the confident facilitators to support all the different circles. We've been doing a lot of training, but there's probably still more training needed. And culture change is not a quick thing. <laughs> it takes time. Uh, so we know that there's, um, you know, there's lots of work to do. But overall, we're getting a lot of positives from the membership. I've realized I've gone over time by about 10 minutes. So I really want to bring, um, I think maybe Kirsty, should we ask you to come in next and um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Green City? And then yeah. we'll come to Pete. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Abby. Okay, so we're, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're a bit blurry. So we're in early, okay. We're in the very early stages with sociocracy. Um, we're a worker co-op. We have about 50 members at the moment. And last May, uh, four of us went to the worker co-op weekend and experienced sociocracy there. And so we kind of brought it back. We're chatting to a few people casually about it. And then we formed a kind of small circle to kind of explore it further. Um, and the last thing we did was introduce it to all members at one of our meetings. So we've not really formalised yet how we're going to take it further or given everyone enough information yet, I think, for us to make a decision on if we're going to formalise it. But I'm just here to talk about what's attracted us to sociocracy. Um, but I think it's quite important to highlight that it's the experiences that so shock to see it addresses, the kind of problems it addresses are kind of things we experience just within hierarchical organisations as well. It's not a purely co-op thing. It addresses quite human needs um, that we've not really been taught to address in proper ways. Um, so yeah, first of all, I'll talk about rounds because that's definitely the first thing that drew us into it. Um, so at the work of co-op weekends, we had the opportunity to sit in a circle meeting with about seven or eight of us. And we had a sort of toy proposal where we were going to donate X amount of money to charity. So we did the whole kind of round structure. And it was really empowering to know that you will get the opportunity to speak and you know when it's going to come. Because it just takes away so many distractions and you really get the freedom to actually listen properly to what's being said and understand. So you can really listen and learn from each other. And the second aspect that was talked about quite a lot at the weekend was check-ins and check-outs, or what Abby refers to, I think, as like opening and closing rings. At uh, first, we found it quite difficult to imagine using those here. It would be quite a bit of a kind of culture change, but we've been doing it in our little small study group, and we do find it really helpful, especially if you've had quite a, quite a lot on your plate, you're quite distracted. You voice it at the beginning of the meeting. And just kind of addressing it makes you kind of recognise yourself why you're not, why you're distracted. Um, and you usually find by the time you come to do the checkout round, you're feeling much better about things. You did manage to refocus yourself by kind of getting it all out of the way to begin with. The other aspect of the meeting structure that we like is consenting to the agenda, which if I'm honest, we've not really been doing properly yet. We haven't really been writing out proper agendas. But what appeals to me is the fact that any topic on the agenda, you want to be pointing down whether you're understanding this topic or you're exploring this topic or you're making a decision. And Abby displayed in one of the visuals earlier, if it's a decision, you're going through all of those steps, you're understanding, you're exploring, you're deciding. So that provide, provides an, an additional kind of structure and keeps you on the right track to kind of knowing where you're going with the meeting and you come away from the meeting knowing what's happened. I think we can quite often have experiences of conversations going back and forth. You make a decision and then you start exploring it further and you come away not quite knowing what happened. And by the fact that everyone has consented to this agenda is everyone taking responsibility to keep the meeting on track and not kind of go off on a tangent. Um, so that's the kind of first thing that we're introduced to social oxy with and it really appealed. The second thing that we came away with um, from the co-op weekend was it provides quite a change of mindset and a different outlook, which is quite a culture change. So the first one is the fact that everyone is taking ownership of a proposal. So everyone should want a proposal to pass and objections are welcomed. Objections are seen as a gift. And 
So I think that was quite a different kind of mindset for us, maybe. Just really keeping it in your head that you should want every proposal to go through. Um, and that objections are a good thing. And we really like the fact that it's everyone's responsibility to integrate the objection into the proposal. And it, so it really forces us to recognise our responsibility towards each other. And we don't want to dishearten anyone who comes to the table with a proposal. We definitely don't want to do that. And if anyone's got an objection, we don't want to dishearten them either. So we're just going to always out in a really valuable voice. And that the second big culture change for me, which I think is really important, is that it encourages a much more confident and positive attitude to change. Um, what you were talking about before, the good enough for now, safe enough to try mantra. We keep saying it again and again, and it really does help to retrain your mindset. Because I think at the moment, we can be quite overpowered by fear. We want everything to work first time. Quite frankly, our expectation, expectations are just too high. Um, we need to be more realistic. So we need to accept that when we try something new, there will be aspects that won't go to plan and things will surprise us. So setting in a time frame, reviewing it, adapting it, the we do measure, I think, keeping that in your head all the time is a big culture change. Good enough for now, safe enough to try. Which leads into the range of tolerance that you were talking about before. The fact that we all have preferences and we have to just accept that we won't all agree on our first preferences. And just keeping range of tolerance in your head all the time really makes you kind of recognise where your objections are coming from. Um, another thing is just remembering that consent doesn't have to mean that we love a proposal. It just means that we can work with it. It's good enough for now, safe enough to try. It's all a totally different mindset, I think, for us. And the more you say it in your head, the more you kind of really start to love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, teaching us to be much more self-aware of where objections come from, I think is really important. And as Pete was talking about before, um, a critical objection is quite different to just not liking something. Um, so we need to think of our objection, is it critical? If not, it could actually have quite a negative impact on the group because you're preventing that group from kind of reaching their aim. But then of course, there's also the issue where sometimes we don't quite understand where our objection comes from. We're not quite sure about something, we can't quite define why. So as Abby, you said before, you're putting a time limit on it, you try it, you review it, you develop it. So you're not just constantly getting held back. Um, because I think what we can experience sometimes is just a bit of paralysis. Um, and we just kind of abandon ideas once we've not got it perfect. And then they get forgotten about for a while until we readdress them and go through the same process. Um, I think this is so important because the only way for us to keep up with outside world is to have these systems in place that allow us to progress and to respond when opportunities arise. Um, and again, with all this good enough for now, safe enough to try, it's really encourage us, encouraging us to actively support people who want to try something new. Um, so that, I kind of talked a bit about objections there, but I want to kind of talk about it in a bit more detail now because what Sociox has really highlighted for me is that it's not actually objections that slow us down, it's how we deal with those objections. Uh, we've all got the experience of meetings running forever and people repeat themselves to make themselves heard. And quite often people are just repeating all the positives of something as if the positives should outweigh the negatives. And so this is quite a mindset of pros and cons and social oxy totally changes that mindset. So we're actually addressing the negatives until we don't have any. Um, because the pros and cons usually we find leaves us with quite binary choices instead of something that's a bit more flexible. And with the whole pros and cons system, you end up with objections that are left unaddressed. And then meetings have to be rerun. So having this mindset that objections make proposals better and that they contain truths. Um, because as we've seen so many times, decisions fall apart later because an objection turns out to be true or because people aren't on board with it, it just kind of gets forgotten about, or we'll, we'll try something, but because it's not about enthusiasm for everyone, it's just never going to be as good as it can be. Um, so yeah, properly addressing objections, I think is a, another big change in mindset. Um, and as I said before, we don't want to dishearten anyone, and we don't want anyone to feel um, like they're not going to voice their opinions in the future. We want to avoid anything that's going to create any negative feelings, because those can be really contagious and quite damaging. And 
But I want to kind of talk a bit about like our current situation, how we would do things without social obviously. It's not necessarily the fault of individuals that objections do get ignored. It's just because without the kind of detailed structure of sociocracy, just the different emotions and personalities bouncing around, you easily forget that an objection has been raised. It's not deliberately ignored. Um, so the next thing um, that's attracted me to sociocracy, it's kind of came a bit later because it takes a bit more understanding and that is the organisational structure. Um, so I know sometimes when you first look at an organisational chart, a socio-ecstatic one, it can maybe still look like a hierarchy to some people, but you've got to really remember that a sociocracy pushes power outwards. The general circle is there to make sure all the points are spinning and the communication flows. So the circles attached to have the really defined aims, they know where their authority lies and they don't need to gain consent from large groups, which we know is really difficult and time consuming. And then these circles are always encouraged to make sub-circles to really keep the power localised so that the people who are informed in that area are the ones making the decisions and the people who it's going to affect are the ones who are making the decisions. So it really makes us, forces us to think about who is really affected by our proposals. Um, but then the other thing is, if, what we would maybe currently find is if you're making a decision in a small group, there is a bit of a fear of people who aren't involved in the decision disagreeing with you. But that can lead into why in sociocracy there is quite clear processes um, for people to be happy with the decisions of others, even if it's not their pre preference, you really do need a clean process so they can understand how you've reached that decision. Um, so if you, a specific circle has been made this decision, it's because they're the most important to do so. And they know within that circle, they've got elected roles based on abilities. They know that the proposal has gone through the full decision process and all the objections have been harvested and brought out and consent given. So that should make people feel comfortable that even if it's not their preference, the decision has been made for the right reasons. Um, because I do think that not knowing how people have made their decisions is usually the root cause of disagreements. Um, usually people know how they've came to it, they can accept it. And if we're all going through the same process, then it takes a lot less explanation <laughs> And so a lot of time can saving and yeah. Um, but the other aspect is a lot of people don't want to take on responsibility because they don't know what's expected of them and they're scared of doing the wrong thing. And so social shock really pushes us to define policy. So these people should feel a lot safer with trying something different. But then the opposite we have of this is you'll have some people who take on lots of responsibility um, but share it amongst a small number of them. And there's a good kind of phrase in the Many Voices One Song book where it says many people can wear many, so many people can wear many hats, but each hat can only be worn by one person. Because otherwise you're just stretching out responsibility and it's getting pushed and pulled and you're waiting for each other to catch up. And if it's something small, it's so much efficient, more efficient and less stressful. You've got one structure really that allows us to break down operations and decisions and making us more organised and we can tune into the finer details and monitor it more closely because it's all mapped out in front of you. Um, so yeah, so in summary, if we want to get away from endless voting in large groups, um, because we all know it's really inefficient and it takes away autonomy as well. Um, and the really important thing for me with sociocracy is it forces courts to be a bit more proactive in the maintenance of their governance because you're constantly doing it. It's just a whole part of your everyday um, processes. It's always under review and adapting. And if you pick up the Many Voices One Song book, there's a really good bit on it about power and about how distribution of power needs to be intentional. Um, I think we, we may well have had experiences of structurallessness kind of leading to natural hierarchies. I think people are still a bit wary that sociocracy so you could still end up with some natural hierarchies. Um, but in the book, they use a water analogy. So to be intentional about prayer, we want power to flow. So we have to be intentional about where we want power to flow, like you would do with water. And we need to make sure it is flowing and not collecting somewhere, because as soon as it collects, it kind of gathers more power. So being really intentional, and we might even not get it perfect with sociocracy, it's probably a bit better than kind of letting it go wherever. Um, so yeah, for us, it's, sociocracy is a system that allows us to respond quickly and harness opportunities effectively. Um, and we just hope it can help us listen to each other better and understand each other better, share things 
dis distribute power more evenly and remove distractions so we can just respond much faster. I think that's, that's everything for me. <laughs> Could I just uh, jump in while I can? And thanks, Kirsty. It's been really interesting. And I just thought, and I love the idea of sociocracy, just taking away the fear of things not working first time. So in that vein, we have got a show of hands um, facility, which I'm hoping that we'll be able to use if we can just ask the question to people now. Is there, is there something that's really chiming with you listening to both Kirsty and Abby today? And can you see... Um, how some of the elements of sociocracy could benefit your workplace. So if you can see the show of hands button where you're on your laptop, could you click it now and we'll just see, I think Abby will be able to see what happens with that. And if it doesn't work, I don't feel any pressure now. Thank you, Kirsty, for that. <laughs> um, we've got 14 raised, 15 raised hands, 16. Oh, it's going up, 17. <laughs> <laughs> Any advance on 17? 17 raised hands. Um, thank Great. you. So um, thank you so much, Kirsty. That was really, really interesting to listen to. And what I love about these things is that um, even for concepts that we all feel quite familiar with and you hear somebody else describe it always for me, I get, oh, yeah, you know, that really helps me reframe it in a way that I understand it even more. So thank you. Um, Pete, shall we come to you? And then take uh, questions afterwards. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Abby. Um, and yeah, thank you, Kirsty. That was brilliant. It was a kind of, um, in many ways, it was a really good kind of segue, I think, from from probably what Abby had been saying to, to kind of what I, I want to talk about. Um, I've been working with um, a co-op some of, some of you may have heard of called Outlandish. Um, I helped them kind of introduce sociocracy and um, with one or two other places. My real interest is kind of participation and uh, democracy in organisations, I guess. Um, but my, like Abby, I wouldn't claim to be an absolute expert in sociocracy. My, my profession is uh, organisational development. It's, it's not even organisational design. It's not about structure. It's more about how things kind of work underneath the surface. So uh, another way of saying that is that I'm really interested in culture, which, which Kirsty mentioned. Um, and so I wanted to just make a few remarks about culture, really. Um, but just before I do that, I also wanted to say that, that for me, kind of the structural stuff, you know, there, there are different aspects to sociocracy. One is the one is clearly the structure, another, you know, the circles and all of that kind of stuff. Another big one is obviously the process of decision making. And, and I wonder, we haven't really gone into all the aspects of that. So, you know, there's a whole... Um, Maybe you just have to kind of trust for now that there are processes to deal with most of the things that you would expect there to be operationally um, in an organization. So things like, Kirsty mentioned it again, agenda setting, uh, electing people into roles, defining goals, all of, all of those kind of operational things that you do, even and the strategic things as well. There are ways of doing all of those in um, in sociocracy, we just haven't got it and setting policies and so forth. But so, so they are all there, trust us, even though we haven't kind of talked about them. Um, the, the thing I wanted to talk about specifically, though, was, was um, really culture. And, and some of what I say will probably be an overlap on, on what Kirsty and, and Abby have said. Uh, so forgive me for that. I just wanted to reinforce a few things. And, and, and the first thing probably is to treat this all as an experiment. So it's been said a few times that, um, you know, you have to kind of try things. And, and probably many of you have heard of Holacracy and, and some other uh, versions of these kind of things. One of the things I really like about sociocracy is it's actually, it, it kind of builds in this idea that you don't have to follow the rules. So you're all, you know, you're pretty much at liberty um, to kind of design and customise uh, so sociocracy in your own way. And the way you do that is you, you try something and you get it into place and then you, you kind of um, just see how it works out. You can adopt the things you like and not adopt the things you don't want to adopt. Um, the the um, second thing I really wanted to say was, um, of course, sociocracy is not a panacea. It's, not, it's just not going to solve all your problems. Um, in, in some ways, what it does is it deals with some areas and it throws up some new areas. So in some ways, my experience of uh, being involved in these kind of things for a while now is that um, 
it, it doesn't always make life easier. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. It would be lovely if you could just kind of adopt sociocracy off the shelf and it would work brilliantly and solve every problem. Um, but actually, um, I think maybe more what it does is it brings some other problems to light. Um, I mentioned Outlandish and, and Kaylee, I think, from Outlandish was going to be here. And she's mentioned, uh, she's come up with this term kind of militant sociocracy, which is a, a way of kind of people trying to kind of use power to kind of force through decisions. And until we started using sociocracy in that way, maybe it was always there, but we'd never quite seen it. had never been quite so conscious. So, so that's what I mean. It, it throws up these things and it, it isn't, it isn't easy because um, addressing the, those kind of problems is a difficult thing in itself. Um, so if you're not up for doing a bit of hard work and dealing with some of these things, I'd recommend you don't really, um, you know, you just stick with hierarchy and uh, traditional kind of ways of doing things. Um, what, what else to say? I mean, in the same kind of vein, and this is very much the, the area I'm interested in, I'm interested in, what happened, you know, if you imagine an iceberg and the waterline, and I'm very interested in what happens below the iceberg, below the waterline. So, so the unconscious beliefs, kind of power, the way people in organizations get scapegoated, um, all of those things which exist in, in every real organization. Um, so, as I say, it doesn't get rid of them because they're always going to be there. Again, Abby, Abby mentioned this earlier. Maybe what it does do, it gives you a little bit more time and a little bit stru of structure on the other things uh, that you can look at. Um, but to do that, you have to have a kind of reflective aspect to it. So, so again, Abby talked about this idea of, um, you know, trying something, uh, seeing how it goes, kind of reflecting on it. That, that part of the reflecting part is so important to me that you keep looking at what's going on and you're able to really step back in times and say, well, what, what, it, what has been thrown up by, by this process? Um, the, you know, again, as I'm saying, I'm interested in things below the waterline. Um, and, you know, two, two very obvious things in, in organisations that are the, are the kind of emotions of anxiety and frustration. And to some, you know, again, Kirsty mentioned this, you know, that um, sometimes objections get left behind. And I think fundamentally that's very frustrating for people. And it leads to people, even in extreme circumstances, kind of even sabotaging um, attempts to get things done. So, so one of the good things about all of this is that um, if you follow the sociocratic decision-making processes and uh, you do include everybody's voice, you know, it may, what you're going to get to, you're not going to get to the perfect decision, but at least people feel really included. And I think that can kind of reduce um, frustration. And, and again, I think both Abby and Kirsty mentioned it, the fact of using rounds is a great way to kind of reduce anxiety in an organisation. Again, it feels kind of slightly clunky at first and it feels weird, but over time, as people get more used to those kind of ways of working, it's fantastic to sit in a round and know that you're going to get your, your turn. And, and then when people, people's anxiety is reduced, and, and it occurs to use the kind of fear, as anxiety goes down, it becomes more, more and more possible to um, adopt a kind of mindset where we're actually welcoming in, welcoming in change. And we're welcoming in new things, which, of course, makes mm. it easier for an organisation to adapt what, to what's going on in the, the marketplace outside, mm. how the world is changing, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it's definitely not perfect, but, it, but it's better than voting um, in, in my mind. Um, I just wanted to say a couple more things about, um, uh, you know, the, the method itself, I suppose. And, and how it's approached and, and, and how it kind of relates to kind of emotion. I mean, one, one of the things I've noticed a little bit, been around sociocracy for a while, is so, sometimes it can become a quite technocratic kind of thing and a bit of an expert thing. Um, so my suggestion is that to counter that, you make sure you introduce some, um, you know, you, you really encourage kind of emotional literacy into your organisation as well and do some separate activities that are going to really bring that in. Um, one of one of you know to, to me we have kind of brains and we have a head and a heart and and guts as well and and sometimes when sociocracy is talked about you know in the decision making process we tend to talk about making rational decisions and it becoming something we can do rationally 
for me, I think it's perfectly valid in a, in a circle decision. If somebody's got a gut feeling that something's wrong or it doesn't feel right in their heart, they ought to be able to say that, even if they're not able to, at that moment, express what it is rationally. I mean, my experience of these things is that when people do that, if the group can then work together, the circle can work together and say, okay, we really respect you have got a really heartfelt objection here, um, then somebody usually will find a way of articulating what that objection is in a rational sense. It, it's quite rare that you can't do that. And, and even if you can't, some, sometimes there's, you, you know, there can be something useful there that is worth exploring. So I, personally, I think this kind of um, emotional literacy is, is kind of vital as well. Um, what else? Um, we've, we've talked about this a little bit. Um, I, I think one of the other mistakes that people sometimes make in implementation is, is that you know, when, you, when you get into it and you start doing it, you think, well, we have to do everything. You know, all decisions have to go to a circle. And, and really, it's not saying that at all. It's saying that, in my mind, very few decisions actually have to go to a circle. I mean, the vast majority of things we do in life and in work, we don't really need to get consent for. If we, if we kind of ask ourselves, is what I'm about, what is what I'm about to do going to cause a problem? Is that going to cause an objection somewhere else? We can normally decide for ourselves. Or I might turn to Abby or and Kirsty and say, "Is that you know, have you got any concerns with me doing that?" That's a very kind of practical way. We don't have to have a formal kind of circle meeting. And, and I'd much rather work in an organisation where most of the uh, the decisions are made outside of circles. And it's only really when you've got real things that you're really concerned about that you bring it to circles. Um, and, and I suppose, again, yes, that's just to reinforce really what both Abby and Kirsty were saying about, I mean, the underlying kind of ethos of this, it's about devolving responsibility. It's really about trust. So it's about being able to, um, you know, so, sometimes in a circle, if you're, if you're going through a, a decision-making process, it's perfectly valid for the facilitator to kind of say to people, um, look, you know, to a small, to one person or two people or a small subgroup to say, look, we trust you to go away and do that yourselves. It's absolutely fine to do that. You don't have to, you know, go through the formal process and kind of block it up at the higher level because we're always trying to push decision-making down. So um, just, just a couple more points to kind of finish off really. And, and they're really mainly about um, implementation. And, and the first one is that sometimes people, and I, I think you kind of alluded to this, uh, Kirsty, a little bit, that um, sometimes people say, ask things like, well, what do you do when, you know, there's kind of resistance in the organization to even doing kind of check-ins? And, and what do you do if you, you have people in the organization who haven't got the emotional or the intellectual capacity or resources to do this kind of stuff? I mean, I have a real problem with that. I, I just think it's completely wrong. I, I think everybody has got the ability to do this and to do it at pace. Um, the difficulty we have is that so many people have worked in traditional organisations where they're not allowed to kind of think like this. And, and all of us, or most of us, have been to school and we've all worked in very hierarchical organisations. So we have to do quite a lot of unlearning of those kind of things to get, to get into mode to make this work. Um, and and we're, again, we're not culturally, we're not taught to include our emotions as, as well as just our intellect. So all of that needs to be unlearned. Um, and, and the other thing, uh, just to finish off really, is that um, the question, and it'll probably come up a bit later on, um, people often ask, well, how does it work in bigger organisations? Um, or how do, you know, all, always for me, you have to kind of start in one very little step. If you want to get to the top of Everest, you have to take one step at a time. And, and nobody really knows quite how it's going to flow out into bigger organisations and into the world and even into bigger, bigger and bigger structures. I mean, there are, as Abby said, there are some very big structures around. But, the, you know, why not, why not just start with a small step and, and start exploring and go from there? That would be my suggestion. Is that okay, Abby? That's perfect. Thank you, Pete. Yeah, it's, um, there's, well, we need to take questions, but there's so many things that you've both said that made me want to say things back. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, this, I probably didn't highlight enough, but early days of Unicorn, it was built on people having a really strong sense of individual autonomy to act. And when there was sort of up to 15 people coming together for the meetings, that circle, the members meeting, um, it was within that frame of people really feeling like they knew what they were doing and they had the authority to get on with it. 
and I think a phrase you taught me Pete a while ago of um you know don't ask for permission just ask for <laughs> say sorry if you get it wrong kind of thing yeah. ask for forgiveness if you get it wrong yeah. and I think in, in small co-ops that works really well so for us sociocracy is kind of rediscovering that as well having circles where the members of that circle feel like they have a lot more empowerment and autonomy to get on with things without constantly needing permission first from the group and also um I've I learnt at uh, the event recently that um, talk, talking in rounds and using these processes is analogous to learning to ride a bicycle, learning to swim, learning to drive. You feel a bit dangerously out of control, and then it yeah. clicks, and you're okay. So you've just got to give it that space to let it click. And um, I think as a really nice guy called Francois, who I met a couple of weeks ago, who's worked in sociocracy, I think for a long time as well, said. If it doesn't work for you, then it doesn't work for you. But just give yourself permission to let it try and work for maybe six meetings or eight meetings and then evaluate. There's nobody saying you must do this, but also just having that freedom to understand that you can try and do this and see how it, it works for you first before a blanket no comes along. That's fab. Nice. Okay, so shall we go to some of the questions that we've got coming in? Some people have had to leave but they've left so, um, all of them wanted to stay. It, they're kind of glued to what you're saying, which is really good. Um, so some of the questions are, especially in Unicorn, can you see sociocracy working across other sites? Does it help that Unicorn's based in one physical place, for example, and how could you see this working in uh, multi-sites? Uh, probably a lot of things about our co-op help that we're a single site co-op because it makes it so much easier for connecting with people and checking in with people and decision making um, but I think sociocracy probably does not have to be limited to that there's certainly some big companies that work in multiple sites that, that use these these frames again it's about um, pushing power outwards as Kirsty said as Pete said as I probably completely forgot to say at the beginning distributed power that's that's sort of the aim of sociocracy so if you've distributed that power and that autonomy to make decisions and you've got the connections where you need them to bring the right people together as needed to check in for information flow and to have that overarching picture that you need for the the broader focus at the top that shouldn't be the decision making at the top really it's just the broader focus to make sure the decision making is happening in the correct frame and understanding mm -hmm. um, and there's no reason why multi-site wouldn't wouldn't work very well could, could i just add abby um i mentioned i work with outlandish and, and one of the things outlandish do very well is um, work with remote workers and so quite a lot of the although they don't have multiple sites quite a lot of the the circle meetings will have members who are remote and and just on a computer screen and stuff like that and, and again you know just thinking about it very simply the the round mechanism is a very good way of making sure you actually include everybody you don't forget the people that are remote Interesting. Um, other questions. So we can see that this is an intricate decision making tool. Um, however, what happens when you've got urgent decisions to make and particularly the thinking about health and safety um, decisions, for example? Uh, should I take that first? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it could work. Uh, consent decision making can work really quickly and really well for urgent decisions, much more so than a more traditional um, Consensus. I actually I don't like saying that consensus is bad, consent good. I see that they're both very much coming from exactly the same space. But um, yeah, consent decision making quickly following the process. All right, we need to act now. We've got to do this thing. Anyone need to ask anything to understand what the thing is um, or what we're proposing? Quick reaction. Everyone pretty much on board with this. Okay, done. Have we got consent? And you could you could do it within five minutes if people are are switched on to doing this quickly. Whereas if you take it to a meeting where there isn't that structure and you have Kirsty mentioned the structurelessness effect, which um, I've certainly seen quite a bit in certain co-ops, definitely mine, um, occasionally, where you don't really know what the frame of the discussion is or how you're going to get to the decision, and it plays out and plays out and plays out. So sociocratic systems could make that really quick, I think. And just to add to what Abby said there, it might look like you've got a lot of steps to go through to make a decision. You didn't understand, explore, decide. When you see that on the agenda, it might make you think that this process is going to take a lot longer but understand explore decide you're always doing these things when you're making a decision but this is breaking these points down and doing them in the right order instead of jumping back and forth and exploring something then realizing you've not quite understood something so you go back and do that and then you it's impossible to keep track when you're doing it in that order and things always get missed in the end so actually it could be a lot 
as Abby said, a lot faster than having a more relaxed meeting structure. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, um, as you said earlier, Kirsty, as well, then you know what the decision is that you've made and you know why you've made it. Whereas sometimes you were, you sort of make a decision and you're not quite sure. And lo and behold, it's popped up on the next agenda for the next meeting. <laughs> um, some questions about the forum and the structure. Uh, just to, could you just go over it again uh, over the, the, yeah, I think they just want to uh, hear that again, actually in Unicorn. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, we have a central forum at the moment, which is made up of representatives from our different teams. And that is a space that's supposed to catch information that affects more than an individual team, affects you know more people um, or something that affects the whole membership. So forum is a two-way information flow. You bring something to forum if you want to get feedback from people, if you want to send it out to all the teams in the business, um, to make sure everyone's okay with whatever the, the potential decision is or the information that needs to be shared. Uh, and also it's used for spending decisions. So proposals for could we have, I don't know, however many uh, hundred pounds for this particular thing that isn't within our team budget because it's our team and another team or it's a general thing. I hope that's an okay explanation. You know, forum is a little bit fluid. Um, it shifts a little bit with its remit and that's something that we're hoping that a socioquatic restructure will fix a little more and give people more authority to just make those decisions in their in their existing teams okay is there a map of organizations that are using sociocracy in the UK um, or examples of organizations using it effectively uh, there's not a map that I know of, Pete. I've never heard of, never heard of one. It's a great idea. I think somebody should create one. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, there's so I know they're in the US, but so Soxy for All have got quite a few case studies. I think there's a couple of people in the UK. A really interesting thing I think is that a lot of people are using sociocracy around the world and not necessarily calling it sociocracy. In the US, that's because there's a fear that sociocracy sounds too much like socialism and there's like dangerous lefty tendencies going on that uh, you know people couldn't possibly countenance. So you could have a completely sociocratic organization, but it's calling itself a, um, a circle structure or a distributed authority circle structure organization or something. So um, there's that as well. Okay. Into account. <laughs> Um, interesting one here. If you're trying a consent-based um, system for the first time, for example, a proposal for a 3.5 pay rise in your organisation, can you play out a scenario how that might unfold using sociocracy? Phil, this is a question for Pete. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. I was hoping you were going to do that one. Um, well, again, I suppose my... Um, take on it first of all would be to kind of uh, experiment a little bit and go quite slowly so so because one of the things is different proposals have different kind of emotional weight so um, if it was a pay thing and it, it was really quite close to people's hearts maybe you'd want to um, go at it as, as a certain kind of pace so um, what that means is as, as Kirsty said the the consent process is broken into these stages um, and that does so. You, so if you like, you're allowed to kind of uh, do a few stages, and then kind of stop and see where you get to, and then kind of work from there. So um, you know, you'd basically just you'd start by trying to get kind of real clarity over what was being said, um, but then you might even at that point you might decide to kind of stop and and take it away and do something different with it. Um, and, and then essentially we just keep using the, the consent process, but in a, in a, at a pace that is appropriate for the scale of the problem. I mean, the next stage, I think Abby covered this, um, having, uh, you know, discovered, um, got clarity, real clarity about what the, uh, the proposal is. So that's not still at this point, not trying to raise any objections. You do move to a point where you're trying to get, um, you're trying to bring up those objections. And, and as Kirsty said, this explained this really well, we're trying to, we, we're trying to gather these objections so that we can improve the proposal. So, because we're trying to find our way forward, we're not trying to use it to block. So, so again, you know, very important skills of kind of listening and clarity and doing all of that kind of stuff. And, and the other thing, um, I usually say when I talk about this and, and when we do it for real in real life is, you know, at, at this point, it's quite a creative process. 
and, and at the best of this, when, when you've got a small group of people working very creatively to solve something, quite often you can come up with a proposal which is really quite radically different from what was, what was said in the first uh, instance. And, and that's a really positive thing. We're, we're, we're still moving forward, but we're moving forward with something that everybody can kind of get behind. Mm -hmm. um, I've, in just doing all of that, I've just really kind of shortcutted the, the consent process. But does that, I don't know, if, what do you think, Abby? You have to speak on behalf of the question. Will that answer? Yeah, I think so. Um, Kirsty, anything you wanted to? Well, I just think in that situation, to understand, you'd first be wanting to understand and also they specified how much the paradise they want is. Um, you want to understand the reasons why they feel they deserve your eyes. And then I guess the exploration part would be gathering the information and comparing across the boards um, what everyone else is on and how frequently paradises occur or whatever. Um, and then in the decision stage, I guess you're going to get objections. People may be thinking, well, I've never had to pay rise, I've been here all this time, or how do I know you're doing all this X amount of extra work and we don't know? So it kind of brings up other problems where you kind of want better things to be able to measure how you do your work. And then in that situation, you may well say, well, in, we're going to integrate this and say in about six months' time, we'll review this again. Or it may be the case where people would agree on a pay rise across the board at a smaller level or something. Um, to integrate people's objections that way. Mm. And, and we haven't mentioned, and you raised this, Kirsty, that you know you might in the first stages you might actually uh, just get the clarity that you need to do some more research. So somebody might form a subgroup to go off and do that research and bring that information back. I mean, as I said, sociocracy has mechanisms to deal with or, or ways of thinking about doing all of these things that you would do in a normal uh, situation. Okay, um, how do you measure how so sociocracy is working in your organisation? Lots of um, evaluation and reflection, I think. Um, Pete's definitely going to have stuff to say that's more useful. This are we Maybe I haven't made clear enough as well that um, at Unicorn, we are still learning and experimenting and we haven't yet agreed as a membership whether we want to sort of fully implement sociocracy or which pieces we're, we're going to take from it so this is all an evaluation process that we're in now we're trying out little bits and pieces and we're finding out from people what they think of them and how they see them developing and um, I think something that was uh, said by Kirsty and by Pete earlier as well that um, you know sociocracy should be dynamic and it should be a movable feast and it needs to be sort of your flavor of sociocracy if you like and I know that the sort of form of sociocracy that we're working on bringing to Unicorn is a very flat structured co-op form of sociocracy and we wouldn't see that sociocratic identity in any way superseded the cooperative identity so us as a worker co-op is fundamentally number one um, and we do quite a lot of evaluation anyway in following members meetings for example standard practice evaluate what worked what didn't was the timing right all that kind of stuff we probably have a slight uh, over surveying culture now where we're regularly sending out little surveys to people to say how do you feel about this that the other but um finding mechanisms that really do invite genuine feedback and people to say what they really think about things is crucial and i feel like sociocratic tools really lend themselves to that being able to speak in rounds being able to reflect and react um, something we've done a little bit in our little implementation group is experiment with the sociocratic process of feedback and review, which is probably another big subject that takes too long to explain here. But there are uh, tools built in to enable people to reflect on how well they're working with people in the same circle as them and to hear, be very open to hearing other people's feedback on that. I think that's quite a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say a little bit about it. I, I just we, I wish there's somebody from Outlandish here who could talk specifically about Outlandish. I mean, I'll, I'll take the risk and talk a little bit on, on their behalf. I mean, I, I consult to um, Outlandish. I'm not a member. But, but Outlandish, for example, as a co-op, has, has gone through a process um, over the years of kind of establishing its kind of mission. And, and the mission is, is two parts, essentially. One of them is about its social purpose, so what it gives back to society. 
Um, and the other thing is about the well-being of the members and all the other people that are involved. So it, it has, if you like, it has a kind of top level of kind of business goals. And, and then below that, each of the circles have um, kind of designed, uh, of, of worked together to produce OKRs, um, objectives and key results, which are connected to those, uh, to that higher mission. So each of the circles is trying to, um, do stuff that is, in theory, kind of aligned with the, with the higher the higher mission, um, and and the process that we use in meetings is to, um, you know, we use the sociocratic methods, but we also use the note taking and 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 bring the OKRs to the forefront and talk about all of those kind of things. So so that's just a, a way of then saying the way that success is measured ultimately is by again looking at those top level those measures of success and at the level of success in, at each level down in the organization. So the OKRs are assessed to see, are we making progress as a circle and is the organization making progress on its goals? Um, and those are measured in the ways you'd imagine they're, they're, where they can, they're measured uh, numerically and otherwise they're measured qualitatively. You just do what you can. Yeah. Um, can you see so sociocracy embedded in charities, social enterprises, um, especially those that want to disperse power, it says, across service users and service providers, I guess um, incorporating volunteers as well? Uh, yes, is the short answer, yeah. <laughs> and I, I suspect there are examples of people doing that in most of those settings already. I, I can't think of any to hand, but I'm sure we could dig some out. I think there's lots in um, in the networks sort of around the sociocracy for all network in the US. There's definitely a lot of um, organisations, and it's very big in um, different places in Europe. Definitely in the Netherlands, where it comes from originally. Um, we know there's quite a few people in Germany, different organisations and groups using it, and Scandinavia. So, I think it's um, it seems to be something that works across a load of different sectors, and it certainly works in volunteer-based organisations because that's another key part, particularly people doing stuff around um, permaculture and transition and things where social change is a key part of who they are and what they're doing because sort of essence of sociocracy, which I think I definitely failed to um, get across earlier, was it came out of this... Um, desire for social change that democracy doesn't work democracy fails us majority voting fails us and there's something much more profound you can do to be part of a well-functioning group and the original theoretical stuff talked about sort of societal change based on these sociocratic principles mm. Um, okay, so we have had a number of questions, some that are kind of more theoretical, um, how's common aim created, define hierarchy and all of that, and I think we'll probably take those offline, but we will be able to answer those and send those to, to the questioners um, later. Um, I just wonder if there's anything that the panellists want to finish off with, anything that they want to add, and if uh, possible, we'll then take it to a poll. We haven't done that before, but uh, we're going to be <laughs> seeing how that works. But anything else that the, the panellists want to say before we depart? Um, one quick thing, somebody uh, popped up a question saying, what's an OKR? An oh, OKR yeah. is an objective and key result. If you Google it, you'll find a whole lot of stuff about that. But basically, it's a bit like, a, it's, just, it's just a way of setting an objective and having some measures of your success. Kirsty, anything? I um, don't think I've got much more to add other than it is a culture change. Um, if you're, in, yeah, we're a bit concerned if you're implementing it, we want to make sure we're training everyone as we go so that no one kind of gets left behind because what could happen is if um, we were to introduce this and there were some people who weren't quite as up to speed, I wouldn't want someone sitting in a circle where you've got four or five people who are really well trained in sociocracy and one person who's not as confident because mm. that's going to leave that person useless mm. and feel quite alienated. Mm. And so just to remind people, it's quite a slow process. We are changing a lot of habits um, and it does, yeah, it's a, diff it's a different mindset, I think, a lot of the time. And and that I guess what, what would be the first steps if organisations are interested in looking at this further and bringing this into their organisation, having meetings about it, is it something that we can look at? What would their first steps be? 
um, in terms, sorry, I kind of sounded a bit funny right at the beginning of what you said there. Um, it's just what would an organisation's first steps be if they're thinking we might want to include this in how we run things in our organisations? Um, where, would, where would they go? Is it online? Is it uh, just Google it? Or are there facilitators that actually support this and, and can implement this um, or at least introduce it in their workplace? Yeah, there are consultants out there. Um, but I'd say Social Oxy for All are the best kind of resource. Um, Abby will be able to say a bit more about it, but they do the online um, training courses where you can have an uh, empowered awareness circle. So your group and your organisation can get together with a consultant and you'll have, I don't know, fortnightly or something, I don't know, um, meetings with them. Or you could do a leadership training course. And then they've got so many resources if you go to their website um, so that would meet people's different kind of learning desires. So they've got lots of slides you can use. There's some good videos you can see footage of their webinars you can actually see footage of their empowered learning circles that they've done and the book is really good as well it's really broken it down into a bite-sized chunks and um, some of the other books are a bit more kind of wordy but this is really kind of broken down so you can really put what happened oh there we go you can turn out where you want it's not like a front cover book you can just phone right in um, and i've got my copy here and it's got all kinds of <laughs> post-it notes sticking outside of it as you can see um, lots of good visuals so I think maybe you'll do cover everyone's kind of different learning styles so that's definitely the first place to go I would say yeah I'd completely echo that um look at Sociocracy Falls website there's lots of information on there there's more and more people getting interested in this in the UK in the worker co-op movement definitely um I can't be there this year I feel very sad about that but the worker co-op weekend I think there will probably be a lot of discussion about Sociocracy there again this year as well um and it's yeah it, it is fairly easy to find some good quality not expensive resources and ways to start and then there are a lot of people out there like Pete who really know their stuff in the UK as well who um, can help organizations uh, I guess uh, the only other thing that I thought I might like to add is that uh, we talked a lot about power recently and the power of knowing the rules being a really powerful part of that um, so making sure that what you're doing works for people as Kirsty said not leaving people behind is a is a massive thing but also understanding that sort of talking in rounds can be as basic as we're just going to take turns and talk in a round now and we'll definitely come back to you and the way that I've been learning sociocracy is to always sort of start yeah. if you're facilitating saying what it is you're about to do why you're doing it and how it works and that constant repetition just means that it doesn't feel alien it doesn't have to feel alien and that we all have to if we if we care about this stuff and lots of us do being able to connect with people make good working relationships with people really valuing sort of what we're doing because we spend so much of our lives at work um then we want to do that as well as we possibly can and these are some fairly simple tools to help us help us uh, to do that yeah That's great. <laughs> <laughs> thanks to everyone i think it's been really interesting and i know that uh, people have been um, well, didn't want to tear themselves away. Some had to because of the time, but uh, but it's, it has been really valuable. Um, before we leave then, uh, so thank you, Kirsty, um, Abby, Pete. And um, Abby, do you want to have a go at pulling up that poll and seeing if uh, we can get the attendees to participate as well as their checkout? And, uh, and we'll see how um, this has gone down and whether it is useful. So how useful was today's webinar in your opinion? one not at all or five very useful and click now if you can and we'll just see if this works and also while you're clicking it, it we are experimenting whether webinars are a really good way of um, sharing some of the learnings that we have here at cooperatives uk we do um, want to do more of these throughout the year so if you're interested in participating in more give us your feedback let us know send us your questions send us your chats we'll get through them all at some point um, but we're really keen to know if this was a valuable um, two hours for for many of you so thank you thank you again panelists and uh has anything come up now abby because we can't see much oh yes it's here in front of me um there are still a few people to answer i don't know if everyone can see it that's the tricky thing with how we're set up today we can't see any of you to see if you're struggling no never mind we tried it doesn't work all <laughs> doesn't work first time we've got 61% of people um, who have taken part and we have 
64% saying five for very useful, 27% uh, saying four for pretty useful, and 9% uh, for in the middle. So Sounds, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you again soon, I hope. Thanks again. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. I need to press anything. <laughs> are we still online? Or are we I think on? we are still live and we still have a few people here um, who can hear us. Um, and we are recording. I am technologically out of my depth. I'm used to Zoom, but not this package of Zoom. No. If we end the meeting, then you guys disappear as well. Um, so. so there's Aaron. Um, we stop live stream, I'll turn that one off, and stop recording, yep.